Okay, well, thank you all for, for joining us for uh, the Autobio Comics Primer with, uh, with Hazel Nulevant. Uh, Hazel is a Portland-raised, Queens-residing cartoonist. They like to create comics to synthesize their experiences and about queer history. Uh, their comics include the graphic novellas If This Be Sin and Sugartown, and the graphic memoir No Ivy League. They have edited and published the anthologies Chainmail Bikini, the anthology of women gamers, and Comics for Choice. So I will uh, I will turn it over to you, Hazel, and I will disappear. All right. For the time Thanks being. so much for the introduction. Uh, how's that looking for a slideshow? Looks good to me. All right. Great. Well, that introduction covers most of it. Uh, these are some pictures of my publications, just so that you can get a visual on my work. And uh, I'm going to talk about making autobio comics, which has become kind of my main artistic practice, although I also am synthesizing it sometimes with uh, historical comics and like researched history. So this is an example of all of the many different formats in which I've done autobio comics. We have everything from something on Instagram to a black and white mini comic to a larger mini comic books. Um, and one of the points that I wanted to make in this talk is that these are all valid destinations for a finished comic and you can kind of let the nature of the story dictate uh, in what way you want to publish it or share it. And this talk is broken down by like things that I use to inspire or, you know, get ideas for autobio storytelling because, you know, in the vastness of your life experience. How do you choose what to write about? And how do you think about what would be compelling as a comic for other people? So here is the first thought. Um, story generator one, things in your life that most people don't understand or that you often have to explain. Uh, and here's some examples from ways that I've used that this is a comic about homeschooling, which I did for the subcultures anthology, which was kind of all about you know, exposing or explaining people's different niche practices. So um, yeah, people usually do not have the right idea about what my homeschooling experience was like. So I made comics to try to convey that. Um, another comic about homeschooling. This is a little bit from the intro to No Ivy League. Uh, bisexuality, I that's pretty well understood, but um, you know, I still found myself having to explain it to a few people. And so I decided to just put that explanation in a comic so that it could be shared more widely and as like a little art piece trans masculinity, less well understood. Um, but yeah, just when I have had thoughts about how to explain experiences or aspects of my life that most people don't understand, then I like to put them into comics. Open relationships, that's from Sugartown. Um, I wanted to write a comic about like Polly, stuff or open relationships because that's not something I see reflected in media very much at all and uh, I <laughs> go for just the the top <laughs> idea on the pile so I was like why well, write something fictional when it's easier for me to just tell a story from my life all right here is the now you brainstorm section so uh get out a pen and paper or something that you can write things down with. And uh, yeah, the idea for these is just to uh, 
write down as many ideas as you can in these different kinds of categories. And I'm going to set a timer for nine seconds. So think about things in your life that most people don't understand or that you find yourself having to explain. Also, if you run out of ideas for any of these sections or you just find yourself wanting something else to do, I recommend drawing yourself because that's a huge aspect of it. And that's something that one can experiment with in a lot of ways. So, you know, if you, if you get bored with any of these prompts, just start drawing yourself. Twenty seconds left. And that's it. That's ninety seconds. Okay. Next story generator. Experiences that changed you as a person, uh, you were different before and after in real life character growth. So this is just basically looking for the things that people tend to find compelling in any story. I forget if it's like the Aristotelian storytelling model or something like that, but um, you know, I've often been told with fiction or just like any kind of thing to distill into a story that uh, have, watching characters change is one of the most compelling things. And so, you know, pinpointing things in your own life that changed you can be a fun way to make comics. So, they, E.G. did a short little comic about how I became a cartoonist. Um, and No Ivy League is about a summer of pulling ivy that took me out of my homeschooler bubble and kind of changed my outlook and flipped my experiences on their head in general. Uh, pinpointing the moment that I decided to break up with somebody, you know, it's a kind of pivotal thing that uh, changed me before and after. Okay, cool. That was short. Now you brainstorm things that experiences that changed you as a person. Also, if anybody does therapy, this is a very, um, this category fits in really well with, with things you talk about in therapy, like, you know, trying to find the start of certain aspects of yourself or, you know, why you are a certain way, how you got over your fear of horses. Okay, 50 seconds left. I'm going to get some water.
and you're done. Okay, on to story generator number three. Stories you like to tell. Maybe they're funny, dramatic, suspenseful, or say a lot about you. This is just like the kind of things that you find yourself telling people in person or you know, maybe on Twitter or whatever, like, oh my God, I got to tell you about this crazy thing that happened. Or maybe, you know, possibly like funny childhood stories or, you know, if like there's, if there's things that you find yourself like repeatedly telling people because it helps them understand you. Um, for example, doing a travel diary. Uh, this is a kind of, pardon me, uh, <laughs> a, a basic diary comic formatted thing, doing a page a day. Uh, but I decided that I wanted to make a comic out of this trip after the first day where I left for the trip and got to the airport and found out that I needed a visa, which had not to visit Brazil, which had not occurred to me before. And that, you know, I had to go to the Brazilian consulate the next morning before I could even go. So at that point I was like, this is, <laughs> this is getting weird. I'm going to make a travel diary out of it. Uh, here's another page of, going to karaoke and getting really drunk and being told by my friend that she thought I was getting catfished and that, uh, and that I could get scammed or kidnapped or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's a little quick comic I made about getting searched at TSA. just because after it happened to, you know, people I was close to, I'm like, oh my God, I gotta tell you about how my flight was. <laughs> um, all right, now you brainstorm. I'm setting the timer for 90 seconds again for stories that you like to tell. And, you know, this, you might not, have anything on the top of your brain right now, but perhaps right after or while you do something or something happens to you, you'll go, oh, I, this could help be a comic. I think I make autobio comics, one, because they're an easy for me source of material and I don't really have the, uh, the puzzle piece in my brain that makes me think of fictional stories. So most of my stuff is um, either autobiographical or researched historical. Uh, but it's also because I just want to share experiences with people in a format that I feel like they'll get it more than if I just told them. Okay, that's 90 seconds. Okay, next story generator. Times when your real life provided blatant metaphors for symbolism. Um, this is perhaps kind of difficult as a generative category. Um, sometimes it can be more a thing of like, after you're working on a story, you see where real life provided the blatant symbolism and you like amp that up. But if you can think of things that actually happened that, you know, are just like 
dripping with symbolism somehow or you know parallels like i don't know you uh took care of an injured bird while someone you knew was dying or something i don't know if you know when you find those things in your real life it can potentially make powerful comics or at least funny or you know add a certain richness to it so yeah this is a example from a comic that i did for chainmail bikini which is the anthology that i put together of comics about gaming and made a little comic about how i used to play diablo 2 but you die if you don't play with your friends and it's about how hanging out with your friends is so uh important and you know is a lifeline um in no ivy league you know that was a that was just the job i had was removing english ivy from the forests but you know it's an invasive species which then has to be arduously removed to return things to their previous state and so you know works as a little metaphor for uproot trying to uproot and dig out and cut off colonialism and white supremacy wherever it may appear in your life and surroundings all right now you brainstorm 90 seconds but again i think this is a maybe a tough way to come up with ideas it may work better as um you know something after the fact to be like oh that's that's works as a metaphor or symbolism and you know it it might even seem like hackneyed or over obvious but if it really happened then can't argue with it that's my view at least that's another thing i like about doing autobio comics is that you know i want people to know like these things were real it's not just something that I thought up um, and I find that significant when I'm reading other people's comics too. Not that fiction can't also be informed very much by reality and telling you real things, but that's a thing I like. Okay, cool. 90 seconds are up. All right, story generator five. Anything you feel inspired or motivated to draw a comic about, need to get it off your chest, etc. This is just a catch all for, you know, doing whatever you want to do, even if you don't see how it, you know, maybe fits into these other schematics of like character growth or metaphors or whatever just you know if if you feel that urge go with it uh at least for me um i i gotta jump on the ideas that i have so this is a comic that i drew at 3 a.m because i was having a lot of thoughts and i just wanted to coalesce it onto paper but it's a real comic by virtue of me scanning it and putting it in a mini comic. And, you know, also I didn't have to do that if it felt too personal, you know, it could have stayed private and that's fine. Uh, but, you know, I am a big proponent of following the urge uh, yeah, here's another comic that I did kind of spur of the moment, like, pretty quickly after it happened, of uh, 
my friend telling me that I am or would be a great guy by virtue of like being a nice person. And, uh, you know, it was really impactful to me. So I guess you could say it was a character change moment. Uh, but yeah, you know, I just ran home and, or didn't run home, but just decided to go with the urge and did it. Uh, yeah, just a one page comic of a friend giving me some good advice about like letting go of interpersonal beefs. Um, this one I haven't really published anywhere, but you know, I just wanted to, to follow the urge. I guess when somebody drops some real wisdom on me, <laughs> I guess I just want to whip out a comic about it as a way of recording it and possibly sharing it. Uh, all right, now you brainstorm. Uh, again, I don't know if you're gonna be feeling this sitting down because kind of the whole thing is that you're, you could be passionately, you can be commanded by your heart to make comics at like random times and you should go with it. Uh, but anyway, this is also about just how I work. Some people have long queues of ideas and, and things that they've been meaning to make and they're just feel like they're overflowing with options. Whereas I tend to like get just one or two ideas maybe for big projects that I'm really excited about at a time. So, you know, I feel like you know, inspiration or anything that gets me excited to do all the work that goes into making a comic that, you know, I want to follow that. Dismiss. Okay, cool. That was 90 seconds. Uh, all right, sweet. I guess that is all of the story generators that I have, but here are some other aspects of making autobio comics character design, uh, yeah, it, you know, involves drawing yourself, but you don't have to draw yourself as you actually look. There's lots of people who do autobio comics with like abstracty kind of animals or like animal stand-ins. I mean, mouse obviously, but you know, people do that all the time, which can also be a really nice um, anonymizing feature. That's a question I get a lot is like, you know, how much do you want to make characters really look like the person? Uh, but anyway, this is a mini comic from 10 years ago. And uh, it's one of my first uh, autobio comics, even though it doesn't have any words, it's just about feelings. but. So this is like the earliest self character design. And it's basically, you know, I tried to do like, what if me and this guy were drawn by Brian Lee O'Malley were like Scott Pilgrim characters, you know, I basically just tried to jack that whole style, but put myself and people I knew in it. Uh, and then this is an experiment from a class that I took at SVA where, you know, we were just supposed to draw ourselves in nine really different looking art styles in black and white and like with different materials. Um, and, you know, it was really good to do this and like be forced to experiment and, you know, work through all these options. Cause you can see at the middle bottom, you know, that one ended up like really working and you know since ever since it's like influenced the way that I draw myself and I've used it as a little logo and whatnot and um 
you know, wouldn't have got there if I hadn't been, uh, been compelled to experiment. Uh, oh yeah, that's another from a, a diary comic that I did about the same time. I would say that's also more and le more or less the trying to be Brian Lee O'Malley design. So a little progression of logo face. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why I put this in here. It's character turnarounds. Oh yeah, that's right. This is kind of this is from the homeschooling one for subcultures anthology, uh, and just you know trying to work out how to draw myself and other people. But this is kind of a continuation of what I did before, getting away from the directly trying to ape someone else's style and uh, progressing towards how I approach it now. Uh, yeah, and this is what I would call like the, the settled upon style and approach for drawing myself. This is from No Ivy League and Sugartown, which are both published, so it's real, but you know, not to, but also it continues to change through repetition and through me in real life looking different. Uh, <laughs> made this little thing of hairstyles that I had at different ages. Um, I think it's really fun to think back to like different times in your life or in your childhood and like, you know, what was your what was your look at that time like what were your favorite items of clothing or what was your hair like especially if it's cringe or you know not in fashion now then i feel like it's especially great but um you know i really enjoy thinking about sort of time period and details and you know trying to make something look so 2000 and late or whatever uh, oh yeah, here's the same concept, but just like worked into a comic that I'm doing now that um, has, has bits and other bits from like a wide time span of my life. And then like a more supposed to reflect how I look at, well, I was, I was like 28 when I did that, 29 now. and. You know, you can see it keeps changing. Uh, yeah, it's a little working out, trying to figure out how to draw myself again because I was, I did a whole book about like 17 year old me, but then, you know, all the while, like my current self was changing and, you know, I wanted to figure out like, you know, my face is kind of a different shape now. Uh, so it's just, playing around with, uh, you know, when I wasn't doing a comic about me right now, but just thinking about, you know, the, how the way I look has changed. Uh, yeah, and here's a little progression of um, trying to evolve like a different way of drawing myself into a little logo which um you know is very literally self-aggrandizing but most of my comics are autobio so it's kind of the consistent thing it's kind of my brand uh oh yeah and this is working out how to draw myself for the graphic novel that i'm drawing now and then there's a finished page on the right and um yeah, part of figuring that out, though, was just figuring out, like, what style of, you know, what pen settings on Procreate to use and what colors to use. Um, so, you know, that's an aspect of the experimentation is playing with your tools. Uh, all right, this is, no, this is not the last section. This is the second to last section. But starting with one moment, this is how I get rolling 
on any story basically and take it from oh i should do a story about this maybe to you know being real and on the page uh and you know i start you know working out how to draw the main players in whatever story um you know i think the best sort of starting with one moment type exercises are something that includes you or another person like you know not just like a generic lineup like on the bottom left there but um you know in action somehow character acting and you know with some of the surroundings and scenery um although i'm moving away from that in my new book because i'm trying to work faster and i'm like i've proven that i can draw a background so i'm just gonna do what is really essential to the storytelling but sometimes it is you know sometimes the background sets the mood in a really important feeling way so yeah these are examples of like some of the very earliest drawings that i did that then expanded out into comics um this is i i did two comics for chainmail bikini because i edited it so what the hell but you know you can pretty clearly see how the first drawing translates into into the finished comic and yeah just something that you can picture really vividly where you're like if i did a comic about this this thing would definitely be a scene in it or this would definitely be a panel in it you know whatever's like crystallized the most in your mind and then you kind of got to work around that sometimes um you know i uh <laughs> especially when i'm doing comics about long ago there's a lot of kind of interpolating dialogue and like you know i don't really remember exactly how this conversation went but gotta like make something up that feels right to connect it um yeah these are early sketches from Sugartown, and you can also see how they translated very directly onto the page. Hmm. Um, yeah, and whoops, there we go. Same principle with No Ivy League, which was kind of a lot to get my head around because it was um, 300 pages, but uh, you know, I divided it into chapters and worked one chapter at a time, which made it a bit more manageable. But yeah, on the left is a drawing I did before I started committing to any final cart, <laughs> any final art on the comic of just like thinking about my boss putting on songs and singing along to them while driving to the work site. Uh, and here's a different sort of starting with one moment exercise. Uh, this, these are all from, uh, I'm not sure if my friend Robin Chapman actually started the Diary Tunes project, but she was definitely the steward of making it happen for a long time. So got to give her credit for that. But, um, you know, the idea of Diary Tunes was to make a, mix cd for your year just like whatever whatever either songs narrated your year or songs that you were you know perhaps just like favorite songs from or listened to in a certain year that you were really feeling um so this is essentially the starting with one moment of mix cd is like trying to pick a moment out of a year that I felt like worked with sort of the vibe and the picture that I was painting or was 
personally significant to me. You know, I approached it by just picking one image like that. Uh, all right, this is the last one that I'm gonna talk about and then we can do questions if you have any, but many exits. So this is the idea of there are many different formats and forms that your ideas that you may have generated or be deciding to work on can take. And, you know, they're all, they're, they're all valid and it just depends on, you know, the nature and scope of the idea and what you want to do. So like, this is basically the first exit possible, uh, <laughs> at least for me, is just like a direct with Micron drawing in my sketchbook. And then, um, you know, this can be, I put that also <laughs> in a mini comic. So, you know, it's done. It's a published work of art. Uh, and this same deal, direct with Micron, no, no editing, no pre-sketching with pencil or anything. Uh, yeah, this one is like almost as direct. I did it with pencil, but pencil as final art and just going like panel by panel by panel by panel and, um, you know, having a broad idea of where it was going because it happened, but just, you know, doing like that one at a time. And, uh, you know, the first time I draw it is what you see, basically. Uh, this is another experiment of um, very direct drawing and then publishing it. I was doing a thing for a while where I would um, take my sketchbook to shows and try to like, visually summarize the vibe, which um, I don't think it necessarily communicates anything to anyone else, but it was a good time. So, you know, this was, um, I think I penciled it while I was there and then mostly drew it with a micron after. Uh, yeah, this is just another, like, slightly more development, you know, it's just as it was penciled into my sketchbook, but then I decided to, you know, fancy up the visuals a little bit by going in with a brush pen and some watercolor. Uh, and this is an example of how I lay out pages or how, how I lay out pages sometimes, you know, it's kind of the starting with one moment approach and then I just go and like draw something that's kind of floating and draw something else. And, um, you know, I could go back and kind of like regularize it into panels, you know, figure out a page layout with like rectangular panels on it, but with this comic, I just like, I really liked the way that it was sitting on the page. So I didn't want to redraw it. So, you know, it's exactly the same layout. And then what I do for that is I um, take, I take the sketches and I enlarge them. You can do that with a photocopier or your scanner or whatever, print them out. Um, and then use a light box with uh, putting nicer paper on top. So then I'm drawing it at a larger size um, and shrinking it back down for print, which, I mean, if you do it larger, it takes longer and you can get too into the details, but also, but also you don't have to cramp your hand with doing tiny lettering and, you know, it can look sort of, whoops, <laughs> almost tipped my mic over. It can look kind of, superhumanly tight just by being a reduction. But yeah, so I didn't try to redraw the layout or anything. And yeah, the point of that is not having to like translate from, you know, your thumbnail, which is small and looks good to a larger page and just 
eyeball it because that's it takes a long time and you know it's easy to lose the energy so why not light box or you know do the same thing with a computer uh yeah so here's an example of you know i'm brainstorming the story in a really similar way this is from no ivy league and then i went back and redrew it as rectangular panels because i decided that that was the style um although normally i don't thumbnail things twice maybe this is advanced cartooning but normally i just figure out how to visualize it as panels if that's what i want to do um yeah so there's the same principle of um enlarging and light boxing and then this is done with uh black watercolor and ink and micron. Uh, yeah, more stages of potential development. Um, just, you know, penciling something and then inking it or penciling it and inking it and adding some tone to it. Um, the way that I do that when I'm drawing physically uh, is I will ink all the black line art on one side, flip the page over, ink everything that is supposed to be a shadow on the other side. Um, and then I can scan both sides in and recombine it. And oh yeah, doing the shadows like on a light box so that I can see where the line art is. Um, that is a technique inspired by Jillian Tamaki this one summer. I don't know for sure if that's how she did it, but there's gray tones or half tones and they have this really nice brushy quality. So it meant that I didn't have to do as much on the computer. Uh, you know, taking it even further by digitally coloring it. You can see I did the same thing for the shadows, but then um, it's a multiply layer in Photoshop. Uh, yeah, and then also watercoloring monochrome or in color is like further stages of elaboration for the ideas but you know the point being you can decide how how many stages you want to do and how elaborate you want to make it and you know at these earlier stages of development if you're already saying like i think this is working i think this is doing what it needs to do, then you don't have to go on and paint it or color it or whatever. But I mean, you can, cause you might be imagining the destination in like a certain book or anthology and maybe it needs to come out a certain way. But um, yeah, you know, everything in there is things that I've published one way or the other. So uh, it all works. And that is the end of my slides. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And uh, yeah, hope you had a good time, thought of some fun ideas. Okay, I will stop sharing. And it looks like we got uh, 10 more minutes. So um, I'd be happy to answer some questions. All right, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna get water while you think of questions. Did, um, did you want me to come back to moderate? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. I'll be right back. Thank you okay. oh, um, uh, So Hazel had asked if you do have any questions, if you can put them in the chat and I will read them out. So like she said, feel free to take a few minutes and, and brainstorm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say that that was great. That was that was really interesting. Oh, um, thank you. I'm I'm always very intrigued to hear how artists kind of go about doing things. <laughs> yeah, and it's so different from cartoonist to cartoonist, which is, you know, one of the one of the many cool things about making comics. Uh, yeah, somebody. Looks like everyone's just sharing oh, cues. Just compliments. I'm glad y'all enjoyed it. Uh, 
All right. You know, I said, I told you, you were going to moderate it, but I'm going to read this question. Okay. All right. Kelsey says, I was wondering how you would approach making an autobio comic with someone else helping to tell their story. Um, that's a good question. I would, I mean, I would read the existing um, autobio comics that are done that way as collaborations. Um, there's, I mean, there's a ton, but there's like the March trilogy, which is the John Lewis uh, comics autobiography. There was that George Decay one recently called, um, they called us Enemy, I think. Um, Band Book Club is a really great one that came out recently. Um, and I think the most fascinating, um, uh, <laughs> the most fascinating example of a collaboration like that um, is that came out recently is Dancing After 10, which I can't remember the names of the artist and the writer whose story it is. Um, I think maybe it's drawn by Georgia Weber, but um, anyway, the writer went progressively blind. So the comic is based on, you know, some of her drawings that she did like with some site or you know, the outside side, <laughs> they're still interesting drawings. But yeah, in the back, there's this whole section about, you know, the collaborative process and, you know, how the artist had to like, um, you know, I think it was based on audio interviews with the writer slash subject, you know, but then the artists would, you know, also have to like describe to like, okay, this is how I broke it down into panels. Like, you know, this is what's in this panel, this panel, this panel. And, um, and, you know, the, here the brushwork is really chaotic. Um, so that's kind of the most extreme of like a collaboration. Also, I guess there's a lot of collaborative comics in Comics for Choice because we tried to pair up people who were not cartoonists, but had interesting things to say about abortion, like either people who'd had them or like providers, um, clinic escorts, uh, you know, we like paired them up with cartoonists to try to tell their stories visually and um, I did not actually draw any of those so I can't speak to that but um, uh, I think just asking them for for reference material um, you know it kind of depends like maybe they would want to write a whole script for it or maybe like you interview them and then you know try to yourself think of like what are the details that would work good as a comic but yeah i don't know just get getting whatever reference photos you can from them on everything possible and then show them your thumbnails or what have you something that is in an intermediate stage so they can check it and see if it's conveying what they want it to convey. Um, okay, cool. Question from Jared. All right, I got to figure out what's the question part of this. <laughs> Okay, so this is about um, doing fictionalized work and uh, because of the potential of autobio to offend or hurt with your interpretations of people. And the question is, have you ever had any friction between a character in your comics and their real life counterpart? Is fear of misrepresentation slash offending the people you depict something you deal with and if so, how do you mediate that? 
Um, yeah. So, I mean, this is another thing where different cartoonists have different approaches and, um, you know, I think fictionalizing, like, maybe making people look different or <laughs> the the drawing everyone as animals one is always a good option. Uh, but I'm pretty direct um, because I tend to draw people like they look as best I can, you know, perhaps I will amp up certain characteristics that I feel like, you know, make them easy to cartoon or make them look different from the other characters in the story. But, um, you know, I tend to try to get a good resemblance. Um, and that's, you know, perhaps like my <laughs> lack of, of imagining what else could be, but I feel like there's always things in people's appearances or like, you know, what, you know, how they choose to dress or whatever that just like say, say things about them as like a person and a character that, you know, I don't feel like I can make up a substitute and convey those same things. Although I do uh, change everybody's names except for mine. And um, that was a hot tip that I got like at the start of my uh, career, I guess, when I was still in college, like just, you know, give everybody a pseudonym. You'll, you'll be happy later <laughs> because you don't have to go back and edit it. Um, but uh, yeah, I've had people get upset of like wishing that I had anonymized them more, which, um, it's a bummer. Uh, you know, it, in one case, I was like, oh, shit, like, I guess I could have changed, you know, this, that, and the other detail and, you know, not sort of changed, like, the integrity of the character, but, like, made it, you know, less connected to them as a real person. But, um, you know, I just go for it. <laughs> uh you know kind of with the attitude of if something makes someone look bad they shouldn't have done it but i just i don't put their name on it because like i'm not actually trying to make it about somebody recognizing them or like changing how people relate to people in real life but you know if it if, if you got the pseudonym on there, it's like, well, this is my memory or interpretation. Um, you know, you can always put in little disclaimers being like, this is a work based on the author's memory. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, I just put in whatever I feel like is needed for the story to like have integrity as a true thing. And for me, that includes, um, you know, the way people look, but, you know, I, I think like using real names would be, <laughs> unless you talk to them about it, like, I don't know. I, or maybe there's circumstances in which you would want to do that, but I feel like, you know, that's a bit unnecessary. But, um, you know, fictionalization is a way, and uh, it's, a, it's a valid way. And, you know, I like to be able to sort of put a truth, that truth stamp on my work, but you know, there's, there's costs to doing it that way too. Uh, but I mean, people can get mad if they like see your, their self in fictional characters too, or think that things are about them. So 
you know, in some ways you can't win. Uh, but yeah, and also just to on, on the whole spectrum of what you might do, um, my friend Maya Kobabe, he did a graphic memoir called Gender Queer, a memoir a couple years ago. Um, and he, I believe, like asked everyone, the real person who made an appearance in the comic to, you know, to, to sign off on, on their part in it. And, you know, so yeah, he like showed everybody what their part was and, you know, check it with them, which uh, I think is really cool, but also is not, is going to be awfully tough on something where you, you know, have a bad relationship with someone now and you want to talk some shit. Uh, okay, uh, it's 5.01 now. So um, I think it's a good time to leave it here. But yeah, thank you guys for coming and thank you for your engaging questions and being engaged with it. Well, thank you for, for presenting this, uh, Hazel. This was really excellent, I think. Well, I, I suppose I can't speak for everyone, but I know I had a lot of fun uh, watching and, and listening and awesome. learning a little bit more of your methodology. All right. All right. Well, well, bye, everyone. <laughs>